Hi everyone, Alvina from Arcadia here. Today on Inspire, we have Patrick Yeo. Patrick is a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers here in Singapore. He leads PwC's Venture Hub practice where he's responsible for servicing clients in the startup and venture ecosystem. With over 15 years of, uh, of experience, he worked closely with startups, accelerators, and venture capital firms. Hi, Patrick. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Hi, Evelina. How, how are you doing? I'm very well. How are you? Good, good. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can just tell everybody a little bit about what you do and how you work with startups. Right. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, thank you for this interview. And uh, what we've been doing so far is really to help startups to uh, go to market, to commercialize their products and uh, their prototype. And on the venture side, we work very closely with uh, the venture capital firms as well as the uh, private investors to look for good investment opportunities as well as to do um, structuring right, for some of their products and, and uh, services as well. Wonderful. So since you work so closely with startups, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you see that a lot of startups, you know, very common mistakes that they make or you know, things that they tend to look over. I think the most common mistakes would be, I would classify into two categories. For the first one would be um, the failure to pay attention to details in terms of the execution, because the execution usually defines whether you know, the startup would be a success or failure. Mm -hmm. Because if you look too much at the broad picture without focusing on how to execute it, I think that would be a, a huge problem. right? The other part of the, the equation would really be the funding. Right. Because startups cannot assume that they only look for money when they need it, but they need to be constantly looking for money. Because a lot of times the startups fail because not because of not good ideas, right? But it's really because of cash flow issues. Ah, yeah. all right. So maybe we'll dive into the first point that you brought up um, a little bit deeper. So what kind of details and execution do you think that you know startups tend to you know really struggle with? I think it's really looking for the right uh, talent, looking for the right partners, and uh, to really look into uh, how do they bring their products right to the market. Having a grand idea is no use if you do not know how to commercialize, how to put your product out there in, the, in front of your customers. So these are small details whereby it plays a huge part into making your product a success for the startups. Got it. So do you help with that? How would you recommend for startups to actually, you know, maybe is it a go-to-market strategy? Is it, you know, coming up with a sound financial budgeting? Um, what would your recommendations be on how they can actually do, you know, some practical advice on what to do in order to be successful in the long term? It's a combination of many factors. Um, you would need to have a very robust uh, business plan to be able to detail what are your key milestones, right? And you track it religiously and to employ uh, partners and people who can help you, right? Because you cannot be doing every single thing yourself, but very importantly, you know, uh, be able to delegate certain roles and responsibilities so that as a team, all right, you can execute it uh, flawlessly, all right? Um, the other part is really looking at um, your budgeting, right? You cannot be looking at it from a day-to-day -day basis, right? You need to look at least uh, 12, to 18 months in advance so that you know that you have sufficient cash flow to allow you to develop your product, your market, and more importantly, all right, to develop your entire business. Wonderful. So how do you normally see, um, obviously when you work with a lot of startups, you see a lot of business plans, you see a lot of go-to-market strategies. What are some of the best ones you've seen and the worst ones that you've seen? The best ones tend to be those that are well, well planned. Right, they do not necessarily have the best ideas, right? but they are really successful in the implementation. So they tend to hook up with uh, loads of uh, very strategic partners that can help them to uh, commercialize, that can help them to broaden you know, their markets, as well as uh, f you know, find them ways to, to enter right, overseas uh, markets as well. What kind of um, strategic partners, do they need to be local or do you see a lot of ones where they are partners that they found randomly overseas or you know, how do you create that ecosystem or how do they dive into that ecosystem to really yeah. help and strengthen their network? I think there's, there's really no other way you know, other than you know, be able to you know, start to network you know, across uh, different uh, markets um, because it's important that you know, your product is scalable and in order for it to be scalable you have to look at the broader market. Mm -hmm. right? So you really got to go out there and speak to people. Right. There's just no other replacement you know, than to speak to people and to find out what are ideas 
discipline there might be, right? Because a lot of times the startups will pivot, right, from A to B because of speaking to some other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the subject of pivoting and partners, you know, how much say or how much um, influence do you think that sometimes founders or you know these entrepreneurs take into account, you know, VCs or other partners that come in or think that maybe they should pivot to a different market, a different strategy, or maybe even possibly change their product? Well, I think the influence is huge, right? Uh, because a lot of times you look at the VCs as well as the strategic investors, they do have huge influence on the way that the, that the startups uh, think and execute. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, you know, those investors have a lot of access and they've seen a lot of startups right, in, in various uh, markets as well as across different sectors. So I think those ideas and those kind of uh, influences will be very useful for the startups to consider because a lot of times we don't want to be, bl to be blindsided Right. right in just what we what we see in front of us right so we need to broaden our horizon and to really to think of other alternatives mm. is there ever a point where the you know founder or leader should not listen to vcs or you know their partners <laughs> well i think it's a tricky situation um maybe there will be one instance whereby you're talking about uh, negotiating for investment. Obviously, you can't <laughs> listen to the VC entirely, right? Yeah. So you got to strike the best deal for yourself. Very true. Yeah. Um, so let's say you know a lot of our viewers will be very new entrepreneurs or very new businesses doing online marketplaces. Um, what would your advice be for you know outside of VC and you know maybe accelerator partnerships? What are some other key partnerships you think that they maybe should take a look at to really grow? Um, that might help them in the short term and long term? I guess other than the investors, you should be looking at potentially you know, the, the industries or the sectors that you're in. For example, if you're an oil and gas, then maybe you should be looking at existing players right, in the oil and gas sector, for example. right? Because these are the guys with the relevant context. And even though you might be disrupting that sector, doesn't mean that you cannot collaborate with existing players to come up with a, you know, an even better product. Hmm. It's very interesting. It is true that sometimes collaboration, even if you think it's a competitor, sometimes a disruptor doesn't disrupt exactly what yeah. they think they're disrupting. That's like right. Airbnb yeah. didn't necessarily disrupt the hotel industry, they're more disrupting yeah. no, rent. Well, if you wanted to disrupt the hotel industry, you still need a hotel to be there, right? <laughs> yeah. Very true. So, um, what do you think is a partner that maybe people shouldn't focus on in necessarily that maybe comes in a much later stage? Mm, I guess there will be um, a partner that just contribute uh, uh, investment dollars, right? Um, because at the end of the day, you know, it depends how you, how you define a partner. Mm. Right? Is it an active partner or a sleeping partner? A sleeping partner will simply just be contributing capital. Right. So for those kind of partnership, then I guess um, you know you need them, right? Because you need the capital. But of course, if you get to choose between an active partner versus a sleeping partner, I think I'll, I'll choose the I'll choose the former. Mm. Yeah. Now, it probably also depends what stage you're at. Yeah, and what kind of skill set, mm. right? Or what kind of value add can that partner bring right to the table? Okay, so we've covered partnerships quite in depth now. Um, what are other you know? day-to-day -day, um, or more detailed things that you know entrepreneurs can do or startups can do in order to that in the short term that help them in the long term um, the, there'll be many things right that the startups will need to focus on so I think 24 hours a day is probably insufficient right for a founder <laughs> that is really enthusiastic about the business yeah. um, really is to, to focus on on the development of um, the product right? Um, to, you'll be able to identify and penetrate the markets that they want to enter. Right? And of course, the third really is to make sure that you have sufficient uh, money, right? sufficient mm -hmm. cash flow. Uh, because at the end of the day, your people, your staff will look to you as leaders and founders to, to, to lead the company. So you would literally have to cover all aspects of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So often, I would assume that since you're saying that they need to identify um, the market and you know really specify the product towards that, I would assume that a lot of companies you see don't necessarily do that. Well, 
again, I think it's about being blindsided by how good your product is, right? Um, sometimes we do see that um, a company has um, you know excellent idea and product, but just having that idea and product and thinking that's the best in the world and it can apply in all situations might not be a good idea, right? Because you cannot be everything to everyone, yeah. right? So you need to find your focus. So I think it's very important that uh, you do some segmentation to find what is the best fit, which market is the best fit for your product so that you can tackle it accordingly. All right. Okay, maybe you can give a little example of what a good segmentation would look like. Um, let's say, you know, in the, in the, let's say machine learning, right, for example, right? So machine learning can be applied in many situations, right? Right. right? But uh, having said that, if you go out and tell everyone that my machine learning tool or software can do everything, but are you sure you're able to, to get a market penetration, right? Because at the end of the day, you need to be industry focused, right? right? There are specifics of that industry that you need to understand in order to apply the machine learning, right? So in order for you to get a first customer. So that's where the industry focus, the sector focus becomes critical. Mm. Yeah. And is that when you would suggest that people, you know, really reach out to those industry experts and kind yes. of pick their brains about right. everything? Right. So hence the collaboration and the partnership and the discussion become critical. It is through discussion that you learn more, right, about the, the particular industry that you want to tackle. How do you normally get startup uh, whether it's leaders or founders, to reach out to these, you know, incumbents or these other experts, you know, is it is it something just like cold emailing or LinkedIn, or you know, is it, you know, trying mm. to find a friend of a friend of a friend yeah. who somehow knows somebody? Well, I like your last example: find a friend of a friend of a friend. Yeah, because I think <laughs> that that would be a lot more effective, right? Because at least there's a face to the name, mm. right? And there's some form of relationship already. But of course, in this day and age, right, through social media, through LinkedIn, through even cold calls, I think there's no harm. Right. Of course, a, a founder has to be thick skin, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. So I think a big one that everyone's probably very keen to hear your thoughts on is funding. Because obviously you work with uh, venture capital firms and everyone. Um, so what are some really, what are some tips you would give for founders who are looking to get some funding? Don't start only when you need the money. All right. Founders should always be looking for money every now and then. Yeah. Okay. How is it ever too early to start looking for funding, or when would you suggest? No, it's never too early. Yeah. I think the, the, you should start looking for funding the moment you have the idea, right? Because funding typically will not come so easy, mm. so quick as well. And where do you recommend that everyone goes, or that people would go to for their first round of funding? Is it friends and family, or is it well, you know, I mean, something like Kickstarter? Instinctively, you know, people will go for friends and family because uh, that would be a good uh, bouncing uh, sort of, uh, you're able to bounce off the idea, right? Um, so if friends and family do see a value in that idea, I think that's a good start, right? So if you look at the startups, most of them will come from fam uh, friends and family first and progress to angel investors and uh, VCs and professional investors, so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned, of course, always looking for funding. Um, but obviously that always, there's so much to do within the company and then you have trying to find money on top of that. How do you recommend that they balance those two responsibilities for well, a very small or new company? Because as a founder, you are the face to the company, right? depending on how many founders you have, right? So if you have other co-founders, then I guess you can delegate the task or spread the task around, right? There should always be someone who, who is focused right, on finding money right, for the company. Um, that is absolutely critical for the survival of the company and it typically takes at least about three months just to close a deal, mm. right? So you really need to start from day one. Yeah. Got it. So I know that there, I mean, there's a lot of, you also work with accelerators yeah. and oftentimes accelerators will actually you know, buy into the companies that they help uh, accelerate. Yeah. Uh, What's your thoughts on you know a startup starting from scratch and trying to find their own funding versus you know being part of an accelerator? What are the pros and cons with that? Well, I guess the, the pros would be if you are with an accelerator, then quite clearly you would have more support, right, in terms of uh, marketing, in terms of uh, uh, giving you mentorship, right? Because a lot of accelerators do provide mentors yeah. in the relevant industry. Uh, versus if you try to find your own uh, support, 
right? That could be a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you look at you know the startups that that are sort of coming to Singapore or being set up here in Singapore, they typically would have some form of relevant experience already before they even start their business. Um, that means that they will have the relevant network, right? So then it becomes that such that you know being in an accelerator might not be uh, so critical mm -hmm. after all. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any accelerators or like types, different types of accelerator programs that you would recommend certain types of businesses go into? Um, again, I think it has to be very industry specific, right? So if you are joining an accelerator, it will be critical that you look for one that fits you know, your company profile, right? So that you can get the right mentorship, get the right access right, to the network that you know, the accelerator would be able to provide. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so, just wanted to touch. So, we're talking about accelerators and funding. Um, how should companies determine how much money that they want to raise and what portion of equity and shares, and etc., to you know give away? There's no magic bullet to that. <laughs> I think there's only one mantra, right? The more, the merrier, right? The more you raise, the better. Mm. Yeah, of course. Um, you have to balance between how much equity you give out, right? And that it's a function of your valuation and what stage of your development you are at. Yeah. Is there um, is it a linear relationship for the most part, or how would you normally say you know for the different phases of where startups are, or companies are, how much they should be? No, that's why the, the business plan is very important, right? You need to define the milestones. What have you achieved so far? That will directly drive your valuation and how the investors will look at how much you are being valued and how much are they willing to invest and potentially support you, right? So at a very early stage startup versus, you know, someone who has already achieved a couple of milestones, the valuation will be very different. And uh, the kind of support that they need from the uh, strategic investors, again, you know, would uh, vary quite greatly. Okay, so on the subject of milestones and, you know, uh, business plan, what are some key milestones that VC companies tend to look at in order to invest in a company? Well, I mean, if you're talking about very early stage startups, then obviously you're looking at whether have you gotten your prototype ready, yeah? And uh, if you go beyond that, would be how many customers you have, right? Have you started to commercialize mm. uh, your product, your, your business, right? And what is the scale of that? Are you, how many markets are you in? Are you in Singapore? Are you in the region? Or are you global? How scalable are you, right? So at the end of the day, it's it, 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 the, the, the kind of value that you get, it's really how scalable you are, mm. right? Okay, so breaking that down, um, I know that you know we often talk about MVPs, minimum viable products, yeah. um, and there are a wide array of what people consider an MVP, right? So when you talk about prototype, what kind of prototype are you looking for? Well, it depends on what kind of business you're in, right? Let's say online marketplaces. <laughs> if online marketplace, then obviously your platform, your payment model, and everything must be must be up and running, mm -hmm. right? So I, I guess um, that is the the basic. Um, to even start to get serious funding, mm -hmm. yeah. And then when you're looking at um, you know number of users, is it number of users that have signed on um, that you have? You know, number of merchants. Is it ones that are transacting? Is it people that come back? Yeah. You know, all these are uh, uh, variables whereby it they will pay, they will play a, a part right in the valuation. So of course, at a very early stage, you know, it's really how many people have signed up, right? Then as you progress, then will be number of suppliers or number of customers, number of transactions that uh, the platform has done on the website. Um, and all these are key metrics whereby the investors will look at to derive the valuation. Yeah. Um, so I guess a follow-up to that would be, Obviously, you always want to set milestones, but you don't necessarily achieve them in the time that you would want to. Mm -hmm. So is it more important to achieve the milestone within a specific time, or is it important you know, like to eventually reach that milestone? Well, of course, uh, it, it's important to eventually reach the milestone, right? Um, but milestones are there and timelines are there for a reason, right? Because the startup ecosystem is evolving very quickly. Mm. Competitors are coming in very quickly. Right. So the timeline to reach a milestone again becomes critical. Because out once your product is out in the market and competitors are able to see it, they are able to copy. Yeah. Right? Especially in certain sectors like uh, e-commerce and so on and so forth. Right? Um, so hence, I think the, the timeline to, to reach the milestone to me, I think it's, it's very important. 
the startups got to move very quickly to move their products uh, to get the funding um, to be able to to go into different markets uh, penetrate those markets very quickly because the first movers advantage can never be understated mm. yeah. Um, so on the first mover's advantage, you know, sometimes, you know, there is that, you know, time is of the essence and there's a race to getting your product out there, which sometimes leads to, you know, there's that very, um, I think it was Reed Hoffman saying, if you're not embarrassed about your first product, then you, you, you know, yeah. launch too late. Um, you know, at what point is it okay for if you're a, you know, a funder, you know, a VC looking at a product and maybe it's a little buggy or, you know, things haven't, things aren't ironed out completely. Um, where's that balance between, okay, I see that you're the first one in this market. This looks like something that's very yeah. viable, um, but it still needs quite a bit of work, you know. Well, I would rather, you know, have a product that's all in the market and getting feedback from real users and you evolve along the way than you wait for two years to make it a perfect product, mm -hmm. then you push it out. By then, your market is gone, yeah. right? So I think it's important, the time is of the essence. Push it out the market, test run it, get the feedback, and do the amendments on an on a ongoing basis. That would be more critical. Do you see a lot of startups with that fear of going to market where they want to make everything perfect or do you see the opposite where maybe they're not completely prepared? No, I, I think the, the, the startups here here in Singapore, um, I mean, at least for those that we have seen, are pretty balanced, right? So I think they typically want to quickly get out to the market um, because I think if you look at the startup nowadays, it's these founders are all very clever, right? Yeah. So they know that really, you know, time is critical. Yeah. yeah. All right, so what are some... Um, common mistakes that you think people tend to make when they're looking for funding? Because I know that everybody probably wants to sidestep those. <laughs> well, I, I guess one, one issue that we have seen uh, over and over again is um, the reluctance to, to, um, to give out equity, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense that um, over, over valuation, right? Realistic valuation for that matter, right? Um, that hence, you know, it, it, it results in a misalignment, right, of expectations. And with misalignment of expectation, it could lead to two things. Number one, it's potentially you might not even get a funding, mm. right? Number two, even if you get a funding, you know, there could be sort of uh, conflicts later on because of, of uh, the misalignment. Yeah. Do you think that that's, is it any percentage of equity or is it when they lose maybe controlling share or, you know, when... Because obviously, yeah. you know, it's their baby and right. yeah. they are always reluctant to yeah. give up a portion. No, I, I don't think it's about losing of control. It's really, the, it's really down to, you know, the exact uh, percentage that the founders are willing to give up for X amount of uh, funding. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've we got to look at the bigger picture, right? How you want to develop your business in the longer run. So at different stage of your growth, the amount of equity you give up, you know, should commensurate with, with uh, your development. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what do you think, um, just in your opinion, what do you think normally is a good balance between the two? You know, when you're just starting, you should be giving up like 5 to 10% and then yeah. slowly. No, I think it's, it's hard for me to answer that question because every startup is different yeah. and also depending on the financial backing the startup has, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're well funded by family and friends, then naturally, you know, you, you would not need uh, to give up a lot of equity to begin with. Yeah. It. All right, so, so to, to wrap, wrap up, I um, only have a couple more questions. Um, you know, you work, up, you work with a lot of the networks and, you know, ecosystems, and I know that you have mentioned before finding the right kind of profile, um, and we were talking about being very industry specific, but obviously sometimes maybe it's a new type of industry or a new type of, you know, caveat into yeah. something. Um, what does a good balanced profile, like network profile, look like? Sorry, what do you mean by that? So, um, let's say I'm a new company, yeah. and you know I maybe lack a certain finance background. So maybe you know I want to find this partner, um, but I don't. Maybe it's also something that's if I'm starting a new company that um, I don't merge two different types of industries, and mm. then kind of finds a new niche. And there's no one that's exactly 
mm. I guess, focus, focus on what I'm doing. Um, how do I, what's, what's a, a, what's a good balanced network profile for me to be kind of reaching out to in order to, you know, is it having one VC person, one finance person, one, uh, you know, kind yeah. of executor person? No, I, I think, I don't think there's, there's a, there's a universal answer to that. Um, very importantly, it would be the, the drive, right, of the founding team and the chemistry between the co-founders, mm. right? Um, because you can always get external parties to help you along the way, to mentor, men to mentor you, right? But very importantly is uh, you, know, you, you need to interview your, your prospective customers, right, in the relevant industry. You need to do robust background research how do you combine the two industries? Right? What are the specific uh, peculiarities right, of those industries? How do you can combine it? What are the things you need to look out for? All this can be done either through research and uh, through talking to people in the relevant industry. Right? And those people in the industry might not be your founding team, mm. which is okay. Right? That's why I think uh, discussions becomes critical. Yeah. So you mentioned um, chemistry between founders being very important. What are your thoughts on single founders? Um, and as an outsider, how do you know when chemistry is good or not? So I guess two questions there. Yeah. I mean, single founder, it's, it would be very tough, right? Because there's so many things to, to take care of. Um, but of course, along the way, you know, more often than not, we see that a startup can start off with a single founder, right? But the person will typically get on a management team to join, right? And along the way, this management team becomes co-founders. Mm. Yeah, um, that's how usually it will it will eventually evolve anyway. Yeah, I think with regards to your your second question, I think it's uh, being having more more founders. Uh, there's no real magic number as well, right? Uh, too many would be no good because there will be too too many different opinions, but too few. Um, well, pros and cons, right? So, but more importantly, it's really the understanding and the chemistry among the co-founders to be able to go through thick and thin. Because mm -hmm. in the life of the startup, it's always up and downs, right? Yeah. More downs than up, to be honest, right? Do you think it helps for co-founders to kind of have that background or friendship from years and years of you know knowing each other, or is that also sometimes a hindrance as well? Well, of course, having having a, a good friend, you know, fighting a battle side by side with you is always uh, always preferred, right? Um, but having said that, sometimes you know uh, you do meet people in your normal course of business, and you tend to hit it off pretty well. Mm -hmm. So you are able to marry the different expertise together, notwithstanding the fact that you know the relationship hasn't been that long. But if you're all driven by a single focus, right, to make the business a success, then I think it should work out pretty well. Yeah. Okay, so to wrap up, last question is, what's one piece of advice that you'd like to share with everybody today? I guess just be, be open-minded, right, in terms of uh, your business. Um, in this evolving uh, new age economy, things are always changing, right? So we all must be prepared to change along the way. Wonderful advice. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Patrick. Thank you very much. It was yeah. a pleasure to have you. Um, if anybody wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Well, I guess you uh, can go to our PwC website, mm -hmm. uh, uh, look for PwC Venture Hub. You should be able to find our contact details there. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, well, that's all that we have today for Inspire. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Until next time, be inspired.